uh, that I sing, if I get a little mushy with my mouth, uh, you can read the words um, and follow along. Okay? Sweet hour of prayer. Annette has our scripture reading. Our scripture is taken today from Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, if you'd like to follow along. And I'm using the New King James Version. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, 
who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Allender. Ryan. All right. Is this, is this working all right? As I mentioned when I was talking about the prayer time, uh, on Monday, I turned 65. I guess, you know, every age is, is a good age, right? But sometimes, you know, those are kind of like benchmarks, you know, when you turn 18 or 21 or, right, 40, right? Or over the hill when you're 40, right? Until you get to 50 and it didn't seem like such a big hill. Uh, the hill gets steeper as you get older, so perhaps, right? Medicare, oh yes, uh, I've already been down to Sanford and talked to them down there about what I got to sign up for and they told me nothing as long as you're working, you're good. As soon as you lose your insurance at work, come down to see us. So I guess I'm all right. I'm going to trust them anyway, uh, as far as I can trust government employees, I suppose. All right. Okay, so, you know, as, as at least for me, as we get older, we sometimes stop and reflect on our lives, how they've gone. You see, not only am I celebrating 65 years of life, but I'm celebrating 65 years of life as a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, that's a long time if you think about it. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite the milestone when people are married for 50 years, right? And I've known Jesus and known about Jesus since birth. My father was a Seventh-day Adventist minister, my mother, school teacher, and um, I have fond memories of many, a family worship, where uh, sometimes I fidgeted because I wanted to go outside and play, and I had to stay inside and pray, right? But uh, thank God for Uncle Arthur Maxwell's bedtime stories and the children's story books, right? And I grew up at a time where we encouraged children to memorize their memory verse, and then on the 13th Sabbath, get up front here and recite them. You folks remember that? We don't do that anymore, do we? Of course, uh, the challenge for us here at Pittsburgh is we don't have any little toddlers that, that could do that for us right now, so that's something that we have to make a matter of prayer. Amen? Amen? As I've gone through my life, there have been times that I look out with, with fond affection and pride and other moments that I just want to kind of hope nobody noticed. Have you had some of those in your life? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so this morning, I don't so much want to preach a sermon as I want to share a testimony, but at the same time, some encouragement for each of you. Okay, so um, humor me, if you will. Uh, I'm not going to stand behind the desk up here. I'm sorry. Sorry, Jeff. I'm hoping this isn't messing up your, your video or any of that stuff. But um, I want to get close to everybody, and I want us to kind of talk about some things on a family level. After all, um, I was told that all of you are my brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Okay? Um, so... So I want us to have a little family chat, okay? N not a Jimmy Carter fireside chat, but just a family chat, okay? All right? As has been mentioned, as, as some of you may know, if you've attended here uh, very much at all, we are uh, looking forward to having some evangelistic meetings. Now, again, growing up as an Adventist, why that was like, it's like camp meeting. It was one of those things that you just do every year, or maybe twice a year, Okay? And um, we haven't had really had something like that in a while. And so um, we have one planned in July, and I think the, the ink is now dry on, 
all the paperwork for us to meet up the road here. Is that right? Just, uh, you can almost see it from here. Uh, the Chatham County Agricultural Center. And we're planning to invite folks from the community here, people that live here in Pittsburgh and in the, in the area, surrounding area, to come over to the Ag Center as we have a guest speaker who's going to talk about walking with Jesus. Now, at first when I heard that, I thought, hmm, walking with Jesus, okay, that's, that's cool, but what happened to the, to the woman dressed in scarlet on the beast with ten horns and all that stuff? Right? You know, what happened with that? Well, you know, that's in the Bible, and it's important. But I've found over my 65 years that knowing all of that, knowing all of that, and not knowing Jesus uh, hasn't helped me. Okay? It's when I focused on how I'm walking with Jesus that all that other stuff becomes relevant and meaningful. So I'm excited about these meetings that are coming up. But I'm also a little concerned, folks. I'm just going to be right up front with you. I'm a little concerned. Because having been in this church for 65 years, or thereabouts, I've noticed that certain things um, are part of the package that goes with conducting a series of public meetings. And those of you who have been around and maybe seen one or two, you know what I mean. It's kind of like an experienced veteran soldier talking to the the guy that's headed off to boot camp, right? Well, let me tell you a few things that you need to know, right? There's a few things that are important for you to come back and be a veteran like me, right? And luck isn't just the only thing, right? There's planning, there's preparation, there's commitment, right? There's obedience. And that's all part of what we're going to need to have for the meetings that we are planning to be successful. There are many churches, Adventist churches in North America, that pretty much have the idea that this whole idea of public evangelism is, well, that was good for the other generations, but it's just not going to work nowadays. People, people won't get in their car and drive over here three or four nights a week to listen to somebody speak. Now, they might, they might watch it on YouTube or Facebook, but nah, they're not going to drive over here. And so what a lot of churches were finding that after they spent the money they spent and went through the effort that they went through, at the end of the day, this is how many people they saw in the pew. Now, wouldn't that be discouraging? Right? All that time and effort and prayer and everything else that went with it, and you see this many people seem to respond. Okay? But does that mean we need to throw it out? Because while we may see this many people come in the door, has there been a change on the people that are already in the door by going through the experience? Does that make sense? So, there is a blessing in these meetings that we're going to have for each and every one of us. Now, what that blessing is might be different. Some of us, it might be the blessing of service. The opportunity to be able to um, feel like we're part of the team and we're working uh, toward a common goal, and that is to reach others for Jesus. That is a blessing, right? Okay. Some of us, it might be the blessing of prayer. Praying for the meetings and those that come, and for our members and for the, for the evangelist who's going to speak. Right? But... We could just leave the, the blessing right here in the pew as we walk out. And um, miss out. Now, 65 years. It's taken me 65 years to perfect the ability to be a hypocrite. It's hard for me to say that, but I need to say it. 65 years developing the ability to be a hypocrite. 
I am a charter member on the books of the Church of Laodicea, folks. I don't know about you, but you'll find my name there. Yep. Blind, naked, feel like I need nothing, got everything I need. Well, I grew up in this church. I have the truth. Right? I've heard it. I've preached it. I've talked about it in Sabbath school, even from the pulpit. But you know, somebody once said it this way. It's not enough to be a Seventh-day Adventist. You should be a seven-day Adventist. And that's, my folks, where I mess up. Okay? I'm a good Seventh-day Adventist for the few hours I'm here at church or when we meet on a Wednesday night. I don't know how good I am at the board meetings, but I do show up for those too from time to time, okay? I just came back from a conference-sponsored weekend event retreat. Oh yeah, I'm a good Seventh-day Adventist and show up when, you know, when there's a meeting, but where am I the rest of the week? What happens to my Adventist life when I get in the parking lot after church today and head home? And I have to tell you, I don't get good marks for that. And I'm ashamed of it, to be honest. And if this was the only message I was giving you, it would be a dark Gethsemane day, okay? Like we sang about in that opening song. But if you noticed in there, it said that Gethsemane, dark as it was, reminds us of the importance to pray. Jesus was about to go to the cross. He was about to die for you and me. He went to that garden, and he didn't have a pity party. He didn't say, oh my goodness, these people aren't worth it. You know, because if he looked at my life, I'm just going to tell you right now, not worth it. Jesus, no, nope, not worth it. Give your life for somebody else, okay? I'm not worth it. But, but, he says, oh, you're worth it. If you were the only person, you're worth it. And he says that to each of us, each one of us. And that's a humbling experience, isn't it? Think about it. He went to that garden, and he took some of his friends with him, his three best friends, his three very best friends, Peter, James, John. John, who loved him, right? When we read, uh, we read about uh, the book of John, it's, he ne he's humble. You know, he doesn't talk about himself. He says, the disciple who Jesus loved. And yet, all three of these, in, in his hour of greatest need, there in the garden with him, he asked them just a simple thing, right? What did he ask him to do? Hey, Peter, get that sword and start practicing because you're going to need it in about an hour. Is that what he did? He said, can you just pray with me? Can you just pray with me? Now, folks, how hard is it really to pray? How hard? You don't even have to pray out loud. You can think the prayer in your mind, right? Right? You just start having a little conversation with God, right? Isn't that what it's supposed to be about? Now, sometimes in our life, uh, there are troubles and things that, that cause us to not be so excited about pausing and talking to God. Either because we're mad at him because he's not doing in our lives things that we want him to do, or we're in a situation that we just don't know what to do with, and God, why did you let me get into this situation, right? Other times it might be disappointment or a tragedy. Loss in the life of a friend, right? Someone passes away that we've been praying for, we've been caring about. So important. God, why did you let him die? It's hard, right? But the act of prayer itself is not that hard. 
And Jesus stepped aside to pray. And what did he ask God? He said what you and I would say. He was a human. God, this is awfully big. I don't know. There's a lot on the line. The entire world, the entire universe, depends on what happens and what I do. Picture for a moment being in his place. How you would feel. How would you feel? Every decision, every move, every word could tip the balances for the entire universe. And what did he say? Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But he didn't stop there, did he? If he would have stopped there, you and I would not be meeting in this room today. We would have no hope. None. Just like Carol Lee was talking about at Sabbath school. Right? We'd have no hope. I'm so glad that, well, in my Bible, there's a little bit of a comma there. Commas weren't in the original text, but he then went on to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, those are the words that, that are recorded, okay? Those are the few words the disciples heard before they went to sleep, all right? I'm sure he had much more to say, but those are the words that we have. I'm so glad we have those words, because those words are meaningful. Those words are powerful. Those words are encouraging. But then when he got up to go see his disciples, what did he find? They were sleeping. They were tired. They'd had a long day. You know, all that arguing in the upper room just wore them out. And Jesus said, what? Could you not just pray with me one hour? Sweet hour of prayer, right? One hour in this beautiful garden at a moment in my life that's a turning point not just for me, but also for you and for the entire universe. And you're sleeping. But you know what? He wasn't too hard on them. He asked them again, would you please pray? with me. He steps aside. He repeated his prayer of agony to his father. And when he was finished, I don't know how long it took, but when he was finished, guess what condition the disciples were in? They were doing their lay activities big time. Okay? They were fast asleep. Three times he asked, Three times, they failed. Now, I don't know about you, but if my three best friends in the world, if that's the best they could do for me, I'm not sure I'd go to that cross. Right? I mean, look, they can't even, they can't even pray with me. Right? Why should I go to the cross and die for them? No. He didn't look back. He went to that cross. Folks, have you failed him? Have there been times in your life where you were found sleeping when God needed you? When your priorities were not his priorities? And your thoughts were more about yourself than what God would have you be or do? Oh, yes. You know, the Bible just has the disciples doing it three times in one night. You know, later that same night, Peter would deny Christ three times. I mean, Peter, he's on a roll, folks. Right? Can't, can't stay awake. Right? Then he gets out his sword, tries to kill somebody. Right? And then later, this same Jesus who is really to 
take a sword out and, and fight for, he denies. Go figure. Does it make sense? Not to me. But you know what? I tend to do the same thing. I'll go get my sword, get my Bible, my sword, and I'll hit people with it. All for Jesus. All for Jesus. And then a few hours later, I'm denying him. Either in my life or my witness. or I'm just, folks, this morning, I'm just being up front with where I, where I see myself. And uh, maybe you can relate to some or, or all of what I'm saying. But you know what? God doesn't leave us there. Hallelujah. He doesn't leave us wallowing in our self-pity and excuses and guilt-ridden consciences. He offers us Hope. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how much? Whoa, 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 wait, 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 how much? Wow. Is that a typo? Wow. That's powerful, folks. No matter how bad we've been, no matter what we've done, all God asks us is to acknowledge who we are, what we are, and what we've done, and give it to him. And he picks it from there. He does two things. We do one. That's a two-for-one, folks. Now, most people, if you get a two-for-one bargain at the store, you're going to buy it, right? Right? Am I right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hugh, if you could get two ties for the price of one, would you do it? You bet you would, right? Absolutely. If you could get two loaves of bread for the price of one, yeah, I'm buying, right? It's a two for one. If we confess our sins, that's not so hard to do or shouldn't be. It's already known. God's already got it written in those books. Right, Brother Nathan? It's written there. It's all there. That's why it took books, as Brother Nathan mentioned in Sabbath school. There's so much there, right? There's no cliff notes on that book. It is what it is. So if we just acknowledge that, God picks it up from there. He is faithful and just. You see how that ties the gospel and the judgment together? Faithful and just. To forgive us our sins and that that would be a good deal right there right God I'm a sinner forgive my sins but he doesn't stop there and that's the beauty of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and our and our message is we don't stop with just let's dunk them in the tank we, we're good he's faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I've been to the store and bought some things that are supposed to be cleansers. Ladies, you might relate to this, right? Uh, Comet, Mr. Clean, Pine Sol. These all things you've heard of, you've used. Okay? And the list goes on, right? If you buy one and try it, it doesn't clean very well, do you buy it again? But most all of those require something besides just Shake the bottle and pour it out. What does it require? Right? And the more of this you use makes whatever you use from the bottle more effective. Am I right? So when God wants to cleanse us, from all unrighteousness. He didn't just, just, doesn't just pour something over us and say, well, I hope that does the job. No. I like iron sharpens iron, right? God sharpens our characters, our lives. He works with us. Now, one good thing about God is, for him, the human race is not a 100-yard dash. 
the human race is not a 100-yard dash. It's a marathon. God continues as long as we're willing, however long that takes. Okay? Now, sometimes you can read on the, those bottles, you know, those things. Uh, effective, you know, uh, 10 minutes, you've got to let it soak maybe, or 15 minutes, and then you can scrub and it's supposed to do the job, right? But God realizes that sin is much, much more insidious than that. No superficial scrubbing is going to take care of the problem. Would you agree? Okay. So God's in it for the long haul. He's ready, he's able, and he's willing to do whatever it takes to cleanse you and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Do I hear an amen? He doesn't say, well, I'll give you a week. I'll give you a month. Oh, I'll be generous. I'll give you five years. He realizes that it is a partnership between you and God, between me and God for the entirety of our life. That's a pretty good commitment, wouldn't you say? Right? God's willing to do that for you and for me for as long as it takes. No, no expiration date like on a coupon, right? That two-for-one doesn't say it expires, you know, if you, don't, if you don't go to a particular place, you know, go to a certain church by a certain date, why, it applies. But otherwise, sorry, it's no good. I'm glad God didn't do that. Wherever we are, whenever we're willing, he's there. Amen? So, if God is willing to do that, what about us? Have you, have you prayed to God, God, I want you to change my life. God, I want you to put in my life all those things I read about, all those things you've promised, all those things you say I can be. I see that picture and I look in the mirror, I don't see it. God, I want to be that person that you want me to be. Have you prayed that prayer sometime in your life? I think most of us have. But the problem sometimes is I'm not willing to pray that prayer and be moldable by God for as long as it takes. For as long as it takes. Now, if it doesn't happen right away, my mind gets off onto other things. I might get discouraged. I might feel like this isn't working. It won't work for me. Right? Have you ever felt that? I know I have. I felt that while I've been here at this church. No offense to anybody who's tried to, you know, minister to me, but no, I feel like, hmm. I talk about it, I think about it, I read about it. I pray about it, but not all the time. And so, just like that parable of the sower with the seeds, I feel like maybe I'm that part where the weeds choke out. All the good intentions, all the good seeds that God keeps trying to put into my life. Have you felt that way? Well, folks, we can be the good ground if we're willing to do what it takes for as long as it takes. Now think about the disciples. Jesus died, and he rose again. Hallelujah, right? Okay? But he had given them that commission. You'll read about it in Matthew chapter 28. He said to those disciples, those, those 11, okay, one of them had kind of strayed away, right? But the 11 that remained, he said, I want you to take this message, this gospel, this everlasting gospel. 
how far were they supposed to go with it? If, if, if he would have said, look, I just want you to share it with your neighbors there in Galilee. Just go on back home, and whoever lives next door to you, just tell them about it. Okay? Wouldn't have been too hard. Yet, how hard is it for us to talk to our next door neighbor about Jesus? Do we find the, all kinds of excuses coming into our head? Well, I don't want him to think I'm some like religious weirdo, right? Or I don't know what I'm going to say to him, or whatever, right? They might get mad at me now, okay, because I tried to religion them, right? So, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, because I'd have to put my hand up first. I'm not very good at sharing the gospel with my neighbor, my next door neighbor. But Jesus didn't stop there. He didn't just say, talk, go back home and talk to your neighbors about, about Jesus and the gospel. He says, take it to Samaria. Okay? Now remember, Samaria is where the Samaritans lived. Anybody heard of the Samaritans? Yeah? The Samaritans? These are the ones the Jews didn't like. They thought they were, you know, um, terrible. They were worse than the Gentiles, because at least the Gentiles didn't know anything. The Samaritans supposedly worshipped the same God, had the same Bible, but boy, they had some weird teachings, according to the Jews. They just said, man, those Samaritans, they have just, they have destroyed, they have destroyed the church with all their stuff they brought in, all the compromises they've made, all the changes, all the things they're not living up to, like the Sabbath and the temple and so forth, right? So Jesus told them, don't just take it to your neighbors, but go to those Samaritans, you know, the ones that nobody really likes. Those people have, you know, have, have lost their way with the gospel. I want you to go talk to them next. And then, where else? Judea, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, the disciples didn't know about Australia or New Zealand South America, North America, all the islands of the Pacific. They probably had heard of India, right? But not much past that. So they still had a small world in their, in their view, right, compared to what you and I have. We know it's a globe and all of that, right? It's not flat and you don't fall off if you go too far east or west, right? Okay? But the world that they knew that you and I can agree was not the whole world as we know it. The task that Jesus had given them seemed almost impossible. Well, it did seem impossible. Think about it. How are 11 guys going to go and, and uh, sh share that message with the entire world? I mean, the disciples had already killed Jesus and they're looking for us, right? Our pictures are in the post office on the wall. They're going to come for us sooner or later. So they hunkered down in that upper room. But what did Jesus tell them to do? He said, tarry. Tarry here and wait until that promised Holy Spirit comes. Now, how long did they wait? Anybody? You Bible scholars? How, how long did those disciples wait? How? Ten days? No. 40 or 50? Well, I'm going to use the word the Bible uses. Now, it happened to be Pentecost. But Jesus didn't say, wait till Pentecost and the Holy Spirit's coming. He said, tarry here until. That's the only word he used, until. What does that mean? Doesn't that mean however long it takes? Right? However long it takes. That's what Jesus told them. Wait here and pray until the Holy Spirit comes. Now, folks, we've got these meetings. They're coming in July. I could say, okay, everybody, let's pray for these meetings until July when they get here. Right? I could say that. And you would know how much time that is, right? What your commitment is. 
But if I said, let's pray until the Holy Spirit comes. Now that's a whole different question, isn't it? That's a whole different subject to pray for. Am I right? But that is what I want to encourage us this morning. If you want a change in your life, if you want the power of the Holy Spirit to be present and poured out on you, you have to be willing to pray and pray, as the Bible says, without ceasing, until. However long until is. All right? It's five letters. Okay? But it's not very specific. Pray until. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I don't have a lot of patience. You know? I don't have a lot of patience. I can, I can go for a while, but then it's just like, nothing's happening, man. I'm, I'm done. Okay? I remember one time uh, my, uh, my uncle was coming from California to visit us in Indiana. He was my favorite uncle. He was funny. He was short, very athletic. He was an Adventist school teacher. And I sure did look up to him. I didn't get to see him very often because we lived in Indiana and he lived in California. So he, he, uh, he showed up. He was coming. My mom said, he, um, Uncle Donald's coming to see us. I go, oh, wow, that's awesome. When's he coming? Well, he's coming this week. Later that day. Well, what day is he coming? Well, I don't know for sure, because he's driving, he's driving from Cal, he's going to stop and see some of his friends, but he's coming. Oh, awesome. Next day. What day is Uncle Donald going to get here now? Mom says, I told you. He's kind of taking his time. He'll get here when he gets here. Every day that went by, I became a little more anxious about it. A little bit more concerned. Maybe something will happen. He won't, he won't get here. He'll turn around and go back home. Right? But I remember when mom looked out the window, you could hear something pulling in the driveway. It was Uncle Donald's VW Beetle in the 1960s, right? You could hear it. You, you know that VW engine has, you know, it has its little sound, right? That air-cooled engine in the back of that thing, right? And I could kind of hear it. I ran to the window to look out to see and make sure it was Uncle Donald in the driveway. He came when he was supposed to come. Right? And I needed to anticipate his arrival however long it takes until he showed up. Folks, it's the same with Jesus. He's coming. Do you believe it? He's coming. We've been told, people close to us, people we've known, have lived all their lives, he's coming, he's coming. Folks, we need to be excited about it. Every day, every day, until he comes. If we want to have the blessings that God has offered to us. We need to be ready to pray and pray and pray until the Holy Spirit comes. Let's not be like the disciples. Man, I'm tired. I had a long day. I don't have time to pray right now. It's okay. You know, disciples could have just said, well, it's okay. Jesus, he's, he's a powerful man of prayer. He can just do the praying for us. But that's not how it works, folks. I can't, I can't live the righteous life for Nathan. He can't live it for me. Even if he's willing to. Even if he valued me to that extent. He can't. We have to be willing ourselves. But what do you pray for? Well, the easiest thing is just pray for the Holy Spirit. If you don't know anything else, pray for the Holy Spirit. But it is helpful if you can be intentional. Have specifics. Now, sometimes I pray for plans that I make. Have you done that? 
I go to the convenience store. I buy a lotto ticket. Say, Lord, give me the numbers. Put them in my head. Right? Doesn't happen. Doesn't work that way, folks. Right? But we do need to be intentional. We do need to be specific. But whose plan would you rather have? Your small plan that has lots of flaws or God's big plan that's perfect for your life? Which would you prefer? Pray for the one you prefer for. Okay? Are you concerned that somebody in your life isn't seeing the value of being a Christian or willing to make the commitments that are necessary to make that walk of faith with Jesus? Are we praying for them? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in heaven to have my family out there. I'd miss them for all eternity, wouldn't you? But are we praying for him? Fervently. Continuously. Until. However long it takes. I have kids that aren't where I think they should be spiritually. Now that's from my perspective. But I can either fuss at them or just write them off or just say, oh well, it's a burden, it's the, it's the thorn in the flesh I have to bear. Or... Lord, I want to see my children changed. I want to see my children loving you, living for you, committed to you. Am I willing to pray that until? Well, however long that is, because life's a marathon. I remember my my grandmother prayed for my grandfather. He, He loved to drink. He cussed and swore worse than a sailor. He would not go to church with her, ever. And many, many a day I heard my grandmother praying for my grandfather that God would melt his heart. God would change him. In her 60s, early 70s, she got cancer. She had diagnosed with cancer. She died cancer, never seeing an answer.